Move the motion and then, of course, the Minister to respond. There is no opportunity for the member in charge to wind up in a 30-minute debate. Order, order. Sarah Brickcliffe to move the motion. Thank you, Ms Knox, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship in this debate today. I beg to move that this House is considered hyperemesis gravidarum awareness. The Minister has been very encouraging of this debate, and I thank her for meeting with me recently to discuss awareness of hyperemesis gravidarum, more commonly referred to as HG, and how we can inc increase awareness of this cruel condition, reduce stigma around it, and improve treatment and care for pregnant women. I became familiar with this condition because of tragedy. One of my constituents, Jessica Cronshaw, whilst 28 weeks pregnant with her baby Elsie, passed away after Jess suffered with HG and was left unable to eat, drink or complete daily tasks. It's a truly horrific story. And before turning to what we need to do to ensure tragedies like this are prevented again in the future, I want to thank Jess's family um, and her partner, Eddie, who are in attendance today, as well as Dr. Caitlin Dean and Charlotte Howden from Pregnancy Sickness Support for all the help that they've provided. I didn't know Jess on a personal level. She was a year below me back at home in school. So rather than me talking about Jess, I wanted to use my privileged position as a Member of Parliament to firstly recount the words of Jess's family about her life and her struggle with HG. Our Jessica was a strong and determined 26-year-old woman whose bright blue eyes lit up any room. Her infectious grin and smile, partnered with a clumsy sense of humour, was enough to leave people in floods of laughter. Jess's capacity for love and embracing any challenge, no matter how big or small, was admired by us all. Jess was a dedicated local primary school teacher in Accrington. Her passion for her children shone through in all of her preparation planning and delivery. She would often spend many hours outside her working day organising and creating school projects to give her pupils the best possible experience. Jess took such pride in her career and her work ethic was unmatched. Jess also had a passion for her fitness. She would without fail walk up our local hill every morning at 5am come rain or shine. Jess benefited enormously from her exercise routines and this was the reason that she was so dedicated to it. She eventually set her own business up as an online coach, providing nutrition and exercise plans for people. Jess inspired and helped so many feel the benefits she was also familiar with. She cherished quality time making memories with her family and friends, and you'd often find her hiking up mountains with her dad, brothers and partner Eddie, or enjoying quality time with her mum and gran. She was a beloved friend to many, providing endless stories of her adventures, which always resulted with everybody crying with laughter. Jess, as a young woman, found true happiness in her life. She was content, she was strong and was a fierce, confident and driven woman. She found true love in her partner, Eddie, and both were overjoyed with the news that they were expecting the first baby in May 2022. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Jess quickly learned that her pregnancy was going to be far from the smooth pregnancy a lot of other expectant mothers experience. Jess went from her outgoing and independent self, exercising every day without fail, working full-time for her children at school and maintaining her coaching business that ran alongside this, to being completely bed-bound from six weeks pregnant. Jess could not stop vomiting, and when vomiting eased, she continued to feel nauseous. All her usual comforts, whether it was a cup of tea, enjoying a TV series, or exercising, became far from her reality throughout the duration of her pregnancy. <clears throat> Jess was admitted to A&E at six weeks pregnant due to being completely debilitated with the symptoms of hypermesis gravidarum. She was unable to eat, unable to keep fluids down, and was absolutely floored, being left unable to complete basic tasks independently. Jess received the diagnosis a week later and was admitted on one occasion for an IV drip for hydration. Jess's symptoms, despite being tried on four or five different medications, continued up until she was 28 weeks pregnant. These symptoms of HG are often unbearable and incomprehensible for women. Not only the physical trauma their bodies endure, 
but also their emotional and psychological health is hugely impacted. There is an impact to the family and friends around sufferers who often feel helpless. Jess at one point said she felt like she was dying due to how severe her symptoms were. If the care around sufferers of HG isn't good enough, the outcomes can be catastrophic. For Jess and her beautiful daughter Elsie, and for all of Jessica's family and friends, her battle with HG resulted in the most devastating outcome. We are left with a hole in our lives and hearts that can never and will never be filled. We lost star Jess and Elsie, tragically, when she was 28 weeks pregnant. The severe HG symptoms became unbearable for her. On the 14th of November, Jess could go on no longer. Her and Elsie survived for five days on life support, and Elsie was christened with the family around them both before Elsie's life support was turned off on the 18th and Jess's on the 19th. Jess and Elsie's passing was preventable. Jess wanted her baby girl, and she had a full life ahead of her. If it was not for this incapacitating condition, or if there was adequate training, awareness, knowledge, care and support from prof professionals who come into contact with any HG sufferer, then we as a family would have had the chance to see our beautiful Jess become a mother and flourish. We as a family hope and pray that no family must ever see the suffering we saw Jess experience throughout her pregnancy, a time that should have been the happiest time of her life. Every day we all have to wake up with, what if? What could we have done more? And end our days with the same thoughts. This is our reality now. Jess, even when bedbound, found, found the strength to lift her head up from the pillow and use a platform on social media to raise awareness, uh, essential awareness of HG. Jess made the courageous start of her legacy, and now as her family, friends, and local community, it's time for us to ensure essential change starts now to the care every HG sufferer receives when they need it the most. I'm sure you'll agree with me, Miss Noakes, this is incredibly moving and a real life example of why we need to enact change. Even in those darkest moments, I know the family were incredibly grateful for the care provided by nurses at Blackburn Hospital on the critical care ward, including nurse Danielle Turner, who changed all of her shifts to be with, fam uh, with the family in Jesse's final moments, as well as the neonatal intensive care unit at Burnley Hospital, whose staff brought Elsie to Blackburn Hospital so she could be christened amongst family and friends. For those not well versed in this condition, HG only occurs during pregnancy and was, and to a large extent still is, stigmatised. If you could not rehydrate women who were suffering from the condition, then they would die of starvation or dehydration. HG is still a severe and potentially life-threatening condition, which can have profound effects on the sufferer's health and well-being. Clinical manifestations of HG can include weight loss of 5% or more of pre-pregnancy weight. With more modern treatments, such as IV fluids, HG can be seen as a mental health problem, where the sufferer is deemed to be making it up or that it's all in their head. But this still misses a point, as while mental health struggles may be a symptom of suffering with HG, they are not the cause of HG itself. This lack of awareness and stigma when seeking support is something that is sadly all too common. An attitude that is dismissive of women suffering based on a pregnancy being their first, and notions in some quarters that sufferers simply were not prepared for the trials and tribulations of morning sickness. But again, the term morning sickness in itself is harmful as pregnancy, as pregnancy sickness, the correct terminology we should move to, doesn't just occur in the morning. This is an unhelpful perception that impacts on women's suffering. If we are to have meaningful change, then we need to look at the support required by those suffering with HG from the outset. Many women who have not suffered with HG before will understandably be vulnerable and struggle to come to terms with their condition and what it means. They should have access to better perinatal mental health support so they have someone to talk to who understands HG. In addition to that, many suffering from HG will need proper nutritional advice. A lack of ability to keep down food and water means that both mother and child can be at risk of malnutrition. 
and from what I understand, proper advice on nutrition in relation to HG is sparse for women suffering. I've heard reports of women going all day on a single biscuit or half a can of flat diet coke. This is not a sustainable situation. I know as well that several of Jess's interactions with medical professionals were over the phone and not in person. This, again, is not uncommon, and it neglects a chance for those professionals to see for themselves how HG is impacting a woman go about her day-to-day -day life. In reality, face-to-face -face appointments should take place as home visits, let, as women suffering with HG will find that driving for any distance, let alone to the hospital, can seriously exasperate their health conditions. Given these three issues, lack of proper mental health support, lack of proper nutritional advice, and the lack of face-to-face -face time with medical professionals, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that the fact that there is no compulsory training on HG for midwives is a situation that surely needs to change. That, coupled with the fact that an appointment with a midwife tends to come in week nine of pregnancy or later, means many women suffering will first see their GP, where again there is no basic diagnostic training compounding the issue further. Around 1% of the pregnant population suffer with HG. That alone is thousands of women at any one time, but it does not account for the number of women who remain undiagnosed because midwives simply are not aware of HG and how it could pre present in pregnant women, or because GPs do not have the relevant diagnostic training. All the while, I'm aware that midwives have compulsory training for dementia, which begs the question, how often are midwives treating people with dementia? I suspect it's very infrequent when compared to treating people with HG, a condition that we know only occurs during pregnancy. But moving on from diagnosis and early intervention, many women will require medical treatment and drugs to help ease the symptoms. But that is a complicated and inconsistent system in and of itself, with responsibility often left to the woman with an attitude of, on her head be it, after prescription. In any other situation, if a person was vomiting continuously, there would be extensive medical testing. But with HG, the usual response sadly seems to be, it's just bad morning sickness. This, even though HG is the most common reason for hospitalisation in early pregnancy. Furthermore, the rate for therapeutic termination of a pregnancy for HG is estimated to be 10% in the UK, accounted for further morbidity and admissions. We do have licensed drugs to help ease symptoms of HG, like Zombia, but this is not accessible to many women, and its availability is something of a postcode lottery at this time. In addition, several hospitals, without hard medical evidence, have banned another drug, Ondansetron, in the first trimester due to historic stigma when it can help prevent malnutrition in early pregnancy, something that can be harmful not only to the woman, but to a fetus as well. We need a much more evidence-led focus on medications to treat HG, one that does not either deny women access to valuable treatment or, when it is prescribed, make women feel like they're taking a risk with their baby's well-being and their baby's life into their own hands. Research in the US and the UK has found that women with pregnancy sickness tend to have much higher levels of the appetite protein, GDF15, and the placenta makes incredible levels of this during pregnancy, which researchers believe might be a genetic cause of HG. I know that there are significant challenges associated with testing new medications in pregnant women. However, if conducted carefully, new GDF-15-based drugs could improve treatment options for HG and definitively prove that GDF-15 causes a condition. I'm told the MHRA is keen to do more work on in-pregnancy trials to improve treatment for pregnant women, and this is something I believe the UK should consider. On a societal level, we need to look at this through the prism of women's health. Young mothers are often stigmatised for struggling with HG with outdated notions that they're simply being soft. In addition, women who do not have English as their first language will struggle to advocate for themselves. It's hard enough for a woman who does speak fluent English to do so when suffering with HG, so navigating the complex system without English as your first language is incredibly difficult. And whilst there are protections in law for women with pregnancy-related conditions, when it comes to HG, with issues such as maternity pay, 
You often find that a woman suffering with HG will be facing acute symptoms, both in the qualifying week and before, meaning that calculations for maternity pay can be based on statutory sick pay rather than their actual salary. This is an added stress that no woman needs, needs when going through such a traumatic experience. I want to conclude again by mentioning Jess and Elsie. Her story is sadly typical for many women who suffer with HG. The lack of mental health support, the lack of nutritional advice, seemingly no knowledge of the condition amongst midwives and reluctance to pres prescribe medication. Jess and Elsie died because put simply, there is still not enough awareness of the condition in the medical community. There's a lack of formalised support when someone is diagnosed and treatment with medication is often not based on science, but on stigma. I hope Jess and Elsie's story is a starting point for change. We need to advocate for a more harmonised approach to HG across the country that incorporates training, support available for women and medication. We need this to prevent more tragedies and get better outcomes for pregnant women across the United Kingdom. And I hope that with the Minister's help, we can prevent anybody from feeling as helpless as Jess did and that we can ensure her memory lives on by getting the right support for women in the future. Thank you, yeah. Madam Chair. Yeah. I thank the member for bringing this issue to the attention of the House. The question is that this House has considered awareness of hyperemesis gravidarum. Minister. Um, thank you, Ms Noakes. Pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Can I start by thanking the Honourable Member for Highburn for a very moving um, uh, uh, speech and uh, just to express my condolences uh, to Jess and her, uh, Jess's family, um, to uh, Eddie, her partner, and also to remember baby Elsie as well. I think the, the speech that the Honourable Member for Highburn has given, I think, has just... Uh, cannot be expressed any better than the way that she put it in terms of the impact of this on a whole family, on a whole community, on an individual. And I absolutely agree with um, every word that she has said. And we did meet uh, uh, recently to discuss Jess's case, um, and I'm very happy uh, to continue to work with her um, on this issue because... Um, there are many women, unfortunately, like Jess, who are going through this, um, probably watching or listening to the debate, who will take comfort from the fact that they're not uh, on their own and that there are many others uh, feeling like this as well. Um, and every pregnant woman who is living or has lived with hyperemesis gravidarum or a difficult, uh, difficult pregnancy will recognise that isolation and loneliness um, and uh, particularly for someone like Jess who had such an active life uh, before uh, becoming pregnant and just that all-encompassing uh, feeling of physically not being well and then the toll that it takes on your mental health as well. And just to, to really e echo what the Honourable Member said, that hyperemesis gravidarum is a severe form of nausea and vomiting. And I think she is absolutely right. We need to move away from that term of morning sickness to pregnancy sickness, but also to be aware that this is very different to pregnancy sickness. That any uh, woman who's experienced uh, uh, nausea or vomiting during early stages of pregnancy know how, knows how debilitating that is. But for that to, to continue for week after week after week, but also to see other other um, pregnant uh, mothers glowing and thriving through pregnancy, sharing photos on Instagram and uh, social media, adds to that uh, feeling of, uh, of difficulty that, um, that uh, an isolation, that they're not uh, you know, dealing uh, with uh, the pregnancy in the same way that many others do. But it can affect between one to three in 100 pregnancies. So this isn't just a small number of women. These, this is thousands of women that are affected. And it can affect an in individual's mood, their ability to work. And many uh, mums are keen to work for as long as they can because they want to take as much maternity leave after they've uh, given birth. And the ability not to be able to work um, and the effect on, on home life, particularly as well if uh, mums have other children that they have caring responsibilities for, 
cannot be underestimated. And um, while most women can be treated at home or as an outpatient, some do need hospital admissions. And it's crucial, as uh, the Honourable Member said, that particularly if they're not able to eat and particularly if they're not able to keep fluids down, it is absolutely vital that that medical care is there when they need it. Because too many women are feel left feeling isolated and unsupported. There is a stigma and taboo around not understanding that this is very different to, to morning sickness as the term is used. And it does affect um, someone's mental health as well as their, their physical ability to cope with their pregnancy. And I absolutely agree more needs to be done to address uh, this issue. There is growing research on this topic. So the National Institute of Health and Care Research um, are awarding funds uh, for research into this, both the causes, the way it can be managed, and then the effects on the actual uh, pregnancy as well um, uh, in terms of that nu nutritional um, impact. And I just want to highlight that the Women's Health Ambassador, Professor Dame Leslie Regan, who's an obstetrician herself, is, at, is really keen to look at this area uh, of hyperemesis gravidarum because in her clinical practice, she has seen the effect of this on women. And she is going to be hosting a webinar um, on hyperemesis uh, gravidarum on the 27th of September in her role as Chair of Wellbeing uh, of Women, which is a leading women's health charity. It's a public webinar. Um, it's uh, free for people to sign up and attend and register. And it will explore the patient experience um, of this condition and provide advice and options for treatment, support and self-care. So I would encourage anyone who's uh, been affected by this um, or has got an interest in this to really sign up um, to that webinar. Um, the details will be published on the wellbeingofwomen.org.uk website. Um, and I think that's the, if we've got the Women's Health Ambassador who's wanting to champion uh, improvements in this area, I think that's the start of the conversation um, uh, to, to, to kind of, as the Honourable Member for Highburn said, um, to start Jess's legacy in terms of raising this uh, awareness for other women. Um, just to also uh, touch on um, the, the, the mental health support um, that is often not there or not accessible. This is not the only case of women not being listened to in terms of women's health. We did a call for evidence ahead of the women's health uh, strategy where we got over 100,000 uh, responses. And whether it was on um, conditions like endometriosis, whether it was the menopause, whether it was on fertility issues... Um, the overwhelming response was women were often not listened to when they asked for help, either because um, uh, healthcare professionals weren't aware of some of the conditions that they were raising, or that attitude that this is part of a, a woman's uh, cycle, whether that's to be pregnant, whether that's to go through the menopause, um, or to go through puberty, and you just have to get on with it. Um, and that's exactly what we want to end, that stigma, and that there are so many interventions that can help women uh, throughout their life course and throughout whichever condition or life change they're going through. And we absolutely, through the Women's Health Strategy, want to, to change that attitude so that women do ask for help, they have a positive experience and feel so supported. Uh, we are looking um, at um, the, the issue around uh, perinatal mental health. Unfortunately, one of the uh, most tragic statistics is that the most uh, common cause of uh, death in new mums is suicide. And that is an absolutely extraordinary uh, statistic to have. And it's tragic to hear that Jess died by suicide uh, because she felt um, so isolated and, and helpless in dealing with her condition. And we are rolling out, uh, um, hopefully publishing very, very soon, the suicide prevention strategy. And new mums, uh, or mums in general, will be a priority group in that strategy because we recognise there isn't the support either during pregnancy or after pregnancy um, to support mums. Um, uh, and the fact that it's the leading, leading cause of direct deaths is something that we want to, to absolutely address. We are doing that already. So mental health services around England are expanding to include new mental health hubs for new expectant or bereaved mums. We are opening up 33 of these, providing psychological therapy, maternity services and reproductive health for women with mental health needs following trauma or loss or directly uh, related to their experience of pregnancy or birth, and these will be available in England from March next year. So I know that's no consolation to Jess and her family, but we are absolutely addressing that um, uh, uh, as, as quickly as we can. We also do uh, recognise the importance of supporting women's health in the workplace, and the Honourable Member for Highburn is quite right. There are uh, laws in place to protect women around uh, maternity leave and discrimination around pregnancy. 
but we don't, uh, I'm very happy to work with the Minister for Employment, the Honourable Member for Mid-Sussex, around raising awareness of this condition, because employers uh, will not be aware that this is very different to early stage morning sickness or pregnancy sickness, um, and that this is something that, that female employees will need help and support with and understanding, and that they sh shouldn't be afraid that this will eat into their maternity leave or, as she points out, to statutory sick pay as well. So I'm very happy to have uh, discussions with the Honourable Member for Mid-Sussex because we've been working very closely on the menopause in the workplace um, and so very happy to take that up. What I will say is that in the women's health strategy where we are looking at uh, the priority areas of women's health, hyperemesis uh, gravidarum isn't in there, although pregnancy is, and I would like to address that because I've heard very strongly from the Honourable Member from Highburn from the tragic experience uh, of Jess and the, the tragic um, outcome for Jess's family as well, how, uh, how difficult an issue this is. I take on board that many healthcare professionals, particularly before uh, a woman goes to see a midwife, will not uh, have had training or um, support in understanding the extent of this condition, but also that midwives themselves, as she says, do not get specific training on this. Um, my suggestion would be that following uh, the webinar in September that the Women's Health Ambassador is leading on, that perhaps we organise uh, a round table with her to discuss some of the findings from that uh, uh, webinar and to see how we can take some of this uh, forward. Because we, do, we have got funding with the National Institute of Health Research around uh, research into this, whether it's managing the condition, whether it's um, uh, supporting psychologically uh, women who are struggling uh, with the devastating, debilitating uh, effects of this, whether it's around the use of medication and, and drugs like ondansetron, we need an evidence base to be able to support, whether it's primary care teams or uh, midwives in uh, giving medication safely to pregnant women, whether it's around the use of hydration and nutrition support if someone is not able to keep down food and fluids, whether it's the training and education of medical staff and midwives, but also whether it's about the stigma and removing that taboo and raising awareness amongst uh, both healthcare professionals but the public as a whole and pregnant women who may not realise that this is a specific condition um, that they uh, should be able to get help and support from and that it's not them just not coping with morning sickness, which you know, very uh, many women do feel that that's the case and actually they've got a very different condition uh, to what many women uh, go through. So um, that the offer is on the table there to try uh, to meet um, the Honourable uh, Lady and to see if we can draw some of the, the findings from Jess's terrible experience to try and uh, eliminate that experience for other women. So I'd just like to finish um, with the, the uh, minutes or so that I have left um, to extend my thanks uh, to uh, the Honourable Member for Highburn, but also once again to Jess's family to say I'm so sorry uh, to hear of the experience that they have had and that Jess's legacy um, is something I'm very happy to support and want to make sure that for, for women who are pregnant, who are going uh, and suffering with hyperemesis uh, gravidarum, that we change the experience for them and that uh, we never again hear such a, a tragic story as Jess's. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered awareness of hyperemesis gravidarum. As many as of that opinion say aye, aye. of the contrary no, I think the ayes have it order order. I'm going to suspend the sitting for two